Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you on this wonderful January morning. If I've not met you, my name is John Fanu, some of the pastors here. And I am so excited about what we're about to dive into in the sermon. Uh, just a few updates. Uh, it's already been mentioned, but most of our staff team is not here uh, this week. So if you have a crisis, you can still call us, but we'll have to fly in. Uh, we have a lot of people in Chicago right now. Our children and youth staff are out there for Midwinter, our covenant, uh, our denominational conference. Uh, Pastor Schumann and David are in India with an India team. I'm still here, but I'm leaving tomorrow for Chicago as well. So uh, we'll be back for next Sunday. But God is doing some great things. Um, we are starting a new series called Immerse Beginnings. And we've been talking about it the last few weeks, and I just want to explain what we're doing here. There are basically, if we were to oversimplify, there are basically three different ways to study the Bible. Uh, one would be called expositional, where you read the Bible straight through, verse by verse, and you go deep, and you usually go slow. And those are very meaningful times, very rich times. You get the details of Scripture. My gut is most people in this room, being from Davis, love this method of study the best, including me. Uh, the second way is what's called topical. Rather than going straight through the Bible, you ask a question of the Bible. What does the Bible say about, and you fill in the blank. What does the Bible say about friendships, about marriage, about relationships, about education, about the environment? And you go, uh, ver you find verses that aren't linear but are in the Bible, and you study it that way. The third way, the way we're going to be doing it in this series, is kind of a quick overview. Rather than going deeply, we're going to read chronologically the first five books of the Old Testament, but we're going to go through it quickly. And the reason is this. Rather than going deep, we want to get an overview of the themes that we would normally miss if we go slowly. By going quickly, we'll actually get to hear more of how things connect and how things are interrelated and the grand themes that God has in Scripture. Uh, I, I talk about some funny things that happen now and then. Like I've been here three or four years. I've met many of you. And I'm still finding out that people I know, like I know you and I know you. But I didn't know you guys were brother and sister. You know what I'm talking about? Like I'll find these things out. Like what? This whole time I've known you and never knew you were father, daughter, mother, sister. And, and, and so it, often I'm talking to you face to face. But when I step back and see all the interrelations, I'm able to see a big picture. This is what we're going to be doing these coming weeks. Stepping back and seeing the big picture. Now, there's three components of Immerse. It was mentioned a little bit. One is reading. So outside, if you haven't got your copy yet, we have the Immerse book, which basically is the first five books in the Old Testament and the New Living Translation version. But all the chapter headings and verses have been taken out, so it reads more like a book. In fact, the reading plan that's in here doesn't tell you what chapter to read, but it tells you what pages to read. So the first thing is a reading plan. It's five days a week, about ten minutes per day. Uh, if you miss a day, it's only five days, so you get to catch up. Um, the second component is, uh, is um, I'm losing my thought here. Oh, it's read. Okay, the first component is getting the book. The second is reading at length, so we're going to read qu quickly. And the third is uh, having discussions about it uh, midweek with your life group. And so if you're in a life group, we encourage you to join the plan. If you're not in one, uh, inside your program, there's a list of some open groups that you can sign up for or, or call the person. Uh, and what we're going to do, just for clarity, is we did this last year with the New Testament, went through the whole New Testament in eight weeks, and everyone loved it, but the big feedback was eight weeks was too quickly, like the readings were too big. So, and see, I thought you guys would be good being from Davis, but we're going to slow down. <laughs> And we're going to go 16 weeks, 16 weeks. So the way it's going to work, though, is we're going to do the first eight weeks together here. And we're encouraging life groups to join for those eight weeks. We're going to take a few-week break for Easter. And then after Easter, we'll do eight more weeks and finish up the book. So we'll get halfway through before Easter, the other half uh, uh, behind Easter. So go through the 16-week reading plan. We will preach on the section you're about to read on so you can start reading tomorrow. Make sense? All right, great. So that's what we're doing. Um, so... Today, we're going to start with Genesis. Now, before I get in there, have you ever walked into a situation that you were unfamiliar with that was just messy, and you're wondering, how did this happen? So one of the things that happened to me when I was in college is my roommates and I rented uh, an apartment, and one day, one evening, we came back home, and we saw water flooding out of our bathroom onto the carpet. And it wasn't clean water, if you know what I mean. And we were wondering, what happened? And so we walk into our bathroom, and the toilet is like, it's not, it's not flushing downwards, it's flushing upwards. And it's going everywhere. And we were like in panic trying to fix everything. And we're, the whole question the whole time was, what happened that caused this kind of mess? That's what Genesis is about. Is about. <laughs> we're going to find out, what is it? 
that we have walked into in this story of humanity and the world. Now, Genesis, the word Genesis is a Hebrew word. It's the first book of the Bible, but it literally means beginning. It's trying to tell the story of the beginnings, how things started, and what is the story that we're walking into. Now, it's tempting to go through Genesis and look at some of the great stories of Adam and Eve, of, of Joseph, of Jack, Jacob wrestling an angel, of Noah and the ark, of Abraham and Isaac. But what we're going to do is rather than looking at those individual stories and trying to draw something out, we're going to step back and say, how do these all connect? What's the grand story that God is trying to tell us when it comes to the beginnings? Now, just so you know, the book of Genesis is divided up into two parts. The first part is Genesis chapter 1 through 11. There are 50 chapters all together. Genesis 1 through 11 is all about God and the world and his relationship with the world. There's a transition in chapter 12 through the rest of the book of Genesis, chapter 12 through 50, where it transitions to God and his relationship with Abraham's family. There's a distinct marked change, and there's a reason. And to understand the link between these two is really important, because once you understand the link, you understand what God is trying to do in the book of Genesis. Today we're going to go through chapters uh, 1 through 11. And the first part of Genesis starts with the creation story, a verse that we're very familiar with, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, there has been so much Christian debate on creation, evolution, all those kinds of things. Here's what I want to say. There are various views, but the main thing that God wants to communicate in Genesis is who he is, that he is the creator, and why he created the how of creation is left in poetic hymnal form, and so there's debate over that. But the point of Genesis isn't to talk about the how, it's to talk about the why and the who. That's why it was written. Does that make sense? And so we're able to read this understanding that God is behind creation. God is the initiator, and he has a purpose behind the creation that affects who we are today and how we're to live in the future. How exactly that happens is debatable, and that's where all the base, and we can still be friends even though we disagree. Amen? Amen. But what we do know is this. In verse 2, the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Here's what we do know, is that God took something empty and formless and dark, and he actually began to create something beautiful out of it. He took the initiative to, to be creative, to create a beautiful garden where humans can flourish, to create animals, to create seas and planets. He was an artist and a great creator, and Scripture says he took so much joy in his creation. In fact, after he was done with everything, he says God looked over at all, all that he made, and Scripture says he saw that it was, say it out loud, very good. He looked upon all that he did, and he had great joy in it. He saw that it was amazing and beautiful and good, like an artist looking at a painting saying, I got to do this, and it gives me so much joy, and what I'm looking at is a part of me. And part of what was very good was when we get introduced to the first human characters, Adam and Eve, because he looked upon them and said, it was very good. Now, Adam and Eve represent particularly two people, but it also represents general humanity. Here's what I mean. Adam, actually, the word in Hebrew actually means humanity, and the word Eve in Hebrew mean, means life. And so this, this story is written in particular ways, but also to give a general definition to humanity and our condition. And so here's what we learn about Adam and Eve. God says God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And so God uses this amazing image that you and I and all of humanity were created in his image. Remember the God who created everything, who got great joy in developing societies? He's saying that he put part of himself into you, and he has delegated to me and you this idea of creation, cultivating society, planting gardens, being creative, and stewardship of his earth. In fact, it goes on and says this, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. 
So you get this picture of a God who created everything and had great joy in de delegating who he was to you and me to continue this process of using the earth for creativity, for, for building, for, for developing cultures and having great joy in it. We reflect his image. Everything from the arts and gardens and everything else. You name a hobby that's creative, that comes from God. So God delegates this to humanity, but he gives humanity a moral choice as to how to go about this. See, not only did he delegate his image into people and give them a commission to, to continue being creative, but it mattered to him how Adam and Eve and how humanity went about this. So we go to this verse, which is pretty confusing, chapter 2. But the Lord God warned him, being Adam, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Okay, what is this whole tree of the knowledge of good and evil? What is all that about? And in case you don't know the story, they did eat of it and it caused chaos. But what is this all about? See, we got to remember that up until this point, Adam and Eve, their point of reference for what is good, what is wonderful, and what is beautiful was connected to God. God was the one who was good, and God was defining good. And for Adam and Eve, he, God was the source of making those decisions. This tree, whether it's symbolic or literal, represents the ability to now look away from God and define for yourself what is good or evil. And that was the temptation put before Adam and Eve. There was a choice. Will humans trust God's definition of good and evil? Or are they going to seize the opportunity and try to find good and evil for themselves? So this is the core question. This is the core tension in Genesis. Will humanity seize autonomy from God and define good and evil for themselves? Or will they trust God for knowledge of good and evil. Say another way, will humanity take good and evil and say, it's up to us to figure it out, and I'm going to rely on my own intuition, or will I trust that God is actually good and we can trust him and not separate ourselves from defining that? <coughs> will I define what's good for me, or will I look to God to define what is good? This is the tension that comes up over and over again in the book of Genesis. This also explains the core concept of sin. The core concept of sin. Sin is this idea of removing ourselves from God as the source of what is good and doing our own thing and missing the mark. This is the crisis of humanity. So here's the problem. Adam and Eve did eat from the fruit. And the problem is that humans are horrible at defining good and evil for themselves. Without God. And so humanity made this choice and things got really, really bad. First, let's look at Adam and Eve. It says, at the moment after they ate the fruit, their eyes were opened. And they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Adam and Eve had a relationship that was bonded, that was intimate, that was joyful, that was celebrative. And after they decide to take their eyes away from God and remove themselves and say, we're going to find, define what's good for ourselves, it immediately introduced shame between Adam and Eve. They now were covering up, and that intimacy with, that was there was ruined. They have kids, Cain and Abel, going ahead of chapter. One day Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out into the fields. And while they're in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. So we begin to read these stories of people learning how to find good and evil for themselves, making up reasons why they can do good according to them, but causing more and more destruction. Adam and Eve's relationship is now severed. It takes one generation, and we have the first murder between brothers. And then a few chapters later, we learn of a guy named Lamech. Lamech married two women. The first was named Ada and the second was Zillah. Now there's a transformation in marriage where women are no longer seen as an equal partner but are now treated as property and seen as less than the men. And we have this intimacy that was supposed to happen being ruined and people being devalued, that image of God lessened and pushed down. In fact, Lamech 
it goes on. One day Lamech said, and actually he was singing to his wives because what we were about to read is actually in poetic form. So he's rejoicing. He's singing a song of joy. He says, I've killed a man who attacked me, a young man who wounded me. If someone who kills Cain is punished seven times, then the one who kills me will be punished 77 times. Here's what he's saying. I just killed a guy younger than me. I am awesome. If people are afraid of killing Cain, they should be even more afraid of killing me because I rock. So now he's celebrating murder. And he takes pride in it in such a way that he's singing a song to his wives about it. Not a romantic song, not a wooing song, but look who I killed. Guys, don't do that. Things get so bad. It's so distant from what God intended, what God wanted, this beautiful creation, this imparting of his image to others, that he begins to feel grief. Scripture goes on and says, so the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. And this leads us into the story of Noah and the ark. We often think that God sent a flood because God was angry with his people. Scripture doesn't use that word. It says God was grieving. He was sad. He created something beautiful, something relationally pure and wonderful, and it was destroyed. And so God says, I need to start over. This is like creation 2.0. I'm going to send a flood and start all over, wipe out this corrupted creation and start anew. But there's one light of hope in this. There's one light of maybe not all people are bad, and it's Noah. It, Genesis 6 says, but Noah found favor with the Lord. So God decides to not destroy Noah, not destroy his family, save some animals and protect this group of people and animals so that they would be the new Adam and Eve. They would be the new creation. So the flood comes, and there's a new creation. Adam and, I'm sorry, Noah and his family get out of the ark. And we think, finally, all that destruction between men and women, all the uh, murder is gone. We have a new start, fresh, clean, washed with water. But what happens right after Noah gets off the boat? After the flood, Noah begins to, began to cultivate the ground, and he planted a vineyard. He went to UC Davis and got a degree and knew how to do that. One day he drank some wine he had made, and he became drunk and lay naked inside his tent. So his first act after getting off the boat, I'm going to make some wine, get drunk, and pass out naked in his own home. It's the first thing he does. Right after this, it says that his, one of his sons came and saw him naked and went out to tell his, his two brothers. His two brothers came in backwards. They wouldn't see him and covered him up. We don't know exactly what happened, but whatever happened in that moment caused a lot of damage relationally. Maybe his son just disrespected him by seeing him naked, but the way it's written, there might be some innuendo, and we don't know for sure, but it's possible that his son had sexual intimacy with his dad, or possibly his dad was drunk and his son had sexual intimacy with his mother, um, Noah's wife. We don't know for sure, but there's some language that correlates to other parts of the Bible that might be true, or it might have been just disrespect. But the point is this. God starts creation 2.0, and right afterwards, this happens. So we keep going through this tragic story, and we find that as we near chapter 11 of this section, humanity just gets worse it grows again, and things are just as bad as before. And the last story is the famous story of the Tower of Babel. In this story, you see all the nations gathering together, united. In fact, let's take a look. They began to say to each other, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone, and tar was used for mortar. We'll just pause right there and say this may not seem like a big idea, but this verse seems to imply that people discovered how to use bricks. This was like new technology where before they would use stone to build. And this new technology got them excited. They're like, now that we can do this, we can make ourselves great. It goes on and says this. Then they said, come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. That word famous actually means this will make a name for ourselves. This will make us popular. This will make us the center of attention. And they see this new technology and they say, we have arrived, we are great, we are the center, we are kings and queens, we can do this on our own. Now, 
before we laugh at them about getting so excited about bricks, <laughs> we have our own technology, don't we? And we come up with some amazing things. I just saw commercials where cars can like self-parallel park by themselves. Maybe you, some of you have those cars. That's amazing to me. We come up with these amazing inventions, phones where I can communicate all the way to the Middle East instantly via video. And we can, it's tempting to look at what we can do and go, aren't we great? We don't need God. We can figure this out by ourselves. But we forget that when we take that attitude, things that God gave us to create and enjoy without him turn on itself and hurt. I keep sharing, we are the loneliest generation ever because of technology. It's keeping us, keep us more separate than before. Even though when phones, iPhones and smartphones came out, it was like we could be more connected. We are anything but that. So God, in his mercy, decides to scatter them with different languages and make sure that they don't go down this path of being the center of the universe and putting all attention on them. God knows that this kind of society would be a nightmare to his creation. So in his mercy, he scatters them. All of these stories underline the same basic idea. Well, humanity sees autonomy from God and define good and evil for themselves. Well, they say, we don't need you, God. We can define it for ourselves. Or will they trust God for knowledge of good and evil? This is the tension. This is what's going on. And some of us who are optimistic will go, well, of course humanity could do it by themselves, but the track record in Genesis is awful. Adam and Eve, a broken and severed relationship that was created so good and so beautiful and so wonderful, severed. Cain and Abel, brothers, murder. Lamech begins to devalue women and takes multiple wives, treats them as property, and kills and brags about it, saying, I'm better than Cain, and I'm going to write a song about it so we can sing it at nighttime together. Noah and his sons, he was the hope. He was the new Adam. He gets drunk, and his sons do something inappropriate that caused a lot of chaos. And finally, humanity with new technology wanting to be like gods. This is the story. And it's depressing, isn't it? And all this leaves us wondering, is there any hope for humanity? This is how chapter 11 ends, right before the transition of chapter 12. Now, we're going to get into chapter 12 next week, and so I'm going to ruin the story. But the answer is, yes, there is hope. Yes, there is hope. God does something that changed the course of history because he's so committed to his creation and his people who bear his image. So that's a little uh, preview of what's going to be coming up next week. This is the depressing part of Genesis. But what I want to share, I want to share four kind of overview things that we can take from this, four principles that apply to us today from this part of Scripture. Here's number one. You were created good and in God's image. You were created good, and God's image is in you. It's important to say this because as Christians, we're aware of sin. We're aware of the corruption of sin. But we have to remember that before there was original sin, there was original goodness. And that when you think of yourself, God looks upon you highly as his creation, as someone beautiful and good, who he has imparted his own essence into, his character and his image. So as you look at yourself and look at those around you and look at people you don't even know, we must have the attitude that people were created good and in God's image, and they are worthy because of that. And if you have any doubts about that, you need to go back and see how God created humanity. You were created good. Here's a second thing that's going to seem to contradict what I just said, but it's also true. But you and I and all of humanity, you have a propensity for evil. That left to yourself, on your own, over time, you and I have a propensity for evil. This rubs against our culture. Right now our culture believes and the beauty and goodness of humanity that left on our own, we will be able to create a utopia where everyone just gets along. 
I was just watching, we had Disney Plus, that channel, and watching the Walt Disney story and his dream of creating the Epcot, Epcot Center was going to be a utopia. He died before it happened, and I think it wouldn't have worked. <laughs> it wouldn't have worked. Right before World War II, even in churches, but society in the West really felt like humanity was improving and that we were going to eliminate all ills. And we were on a path to usher heaven into earth on our own. And there was great hope and, and optimism in society. But then World War II happened. And all that optimism went away to cynicism. And people lost hope. And we have these cycles over and over again thinking, on our own, we will develop good as a society. And there are seasons where we might see it. But the patterns of humanity is over time, the propensity of evil keeps showing up. So on one hand, you are good and beautiful and wonderful and creative and made in the image of God. On the other hand, you and I have this propensity over time on our own towards evil because we tend to decide what is good on our own. Here's number three. That propensity for evil is rooted in our desire of, for autonomy from God. In other words, that propensity of evil, its root of that, is our desire to do things away from God and not look to him for direction. It's a desire to look to ourselves and to find good for ourselves, and that is the root of our propensity to, to for, towards evil. I think of the story I shared with you with our toilet overflowing. We spent so much time trying to figure out what was going on. We flushed a lot. Flush did the reverse of what it should do. We unscrewed screws. We lifted up the tank. We just tried to figure out what was going on. Everything we tried was not working. So we swallowed our pride and called an amazing person called a plumber. And uh, that plumber came at 2 a.m. and looked at what was going on. But he decided not to work on our toilet. He went outside of our apartment. We didn't even look outside. And found out that sewage, the main sewage for our whole apartment complex was clogged up. That's why every time we flushed, nothing happened. See, Jesus wants you and me to know that on our own, we can't figure it out. That we are highly dependent on God for goodness. Does that mean we can't do anything good? Of course not. We are creating His image. Does that mean there are no good people? Of course not. But what that means is that over time, left to our own devices, we will lean towards doing bad for society. And that badness is rooted in the desire of autonomy from God. And here's the fourth thing, is that there is hope. There is hope. Genesis chapter 12 begins a new story where God intercedes again. And to ruin the story a little bit for us, it's the beginning of a story that ultimately leads to Jesus Christ. That God in his love for us provides a way out of this mess we've created that leads to Jesus who provides a way for our souls to be cleansed, for our hearts to be made right, for that connection to be remade, and for redemption to happen, where God begins to take what is bad and redeems it into something good, that God does not quit on you and me. So there is hope, but we can't have hope unless we know what the problem is. And Genesis 1-11 to is that story of brokenness in light of great hope of creation and goodness that God intended. So with that, I want to challenge you. Make sure you understand your identity, that you are beautiful, good, and wonderful in God's eyes. Make sure you have an honest assessment of yourself, that on your own, you will lean towards choosing a self-defined version of good that ultimately benefits you at the cost of other people. Know that that propensity is rooted in our separation from God and not looking to Him for the source of goodness. And know that God has not given up on us. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. Amen. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your word. I pray, God, that we would be able to see the grand themes and understand what you're up to. Lord, for many of us, I ask that you would renew our image of ourselves, that you create us in your image and good. God, for some, we ask that you would help us swallow our pride and come to the realization that we are broken without you. And Lord, I pray that we would not go to self-help books or 
things that rely on ourselves for the solution, but Lord, we would ultimately look to you, the source of goodness. And we thank you, God, that you have not given up on us. We pray this in Jesus' good name and all God's people say, amen.